Hi everyone. Thank you for coming on this very cold and unusual day. And it's my great pleasure to welcome Professor Gabor Levy from Aarhus University in Denmark, who will talk about some interesting non-atomic methods in ecological research. This is very, yeah, this makes me very happy because no, until nowadays, insects are treated by just uh, something based or, or you don't care about them, but this seems to be changing, and Gabor will record this. Just a short bio of Gabor, he got his PhD at the University of Szeged, I don't know when, it's quite a long time ago. Probably. Some time ago, yes. Yeah. And then he spent two years in Italy, then he moved to New Zealand and finally arrived in Denmark, where he becomes a professor of agroecology and he continues this line of research until then. Carol. Thank you, Zoltan. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to talk about this. Um, and thank you for, for coming. Um, this is a relatively recent uh, um, concern of mine. I have been working with insects uh, all my career. And uh, with, mostly with uh, ground beetles. And you know that the traditional method is pitfall trapping with a lot of bycatch. And I do remember in my early days at the Plant Protection Institute, we had uh, big discussions with my colleagues whether we should keep the bycatch or throw it out. Because for tens of years, uh, they were just clogging up and uh, there was no uh, possibility or no chance of, of uh, uh, doing things with this. But my colleague Ferenc Senkirai has always been adamant that everything should be kept, uh, maybe in the future, and uh, that was a premonition. At that time, I, I didn't think it was a good idea, but uh, now, it, as you will see, um, it is not uh, uh, useless. So, it's with my former PhD student, who is now uh, a young scientist at the University of Göttingen, and uh, the talk is, is based on two papers, uh, one in, in uh, biological conservation, where we examine the practice, uh, especially the practice of uh, uh, projects where the focus and the aim was to protect insects. And the other one is a, a big a, a review in annual review of entomology, where we also with Marco, we wrote a review about available non-lethal methods. Um, so, but uh, first, um, roughly what I would like to talk about, uh, very briefly, I assume that many of you have, have background in um, ecology or entomology, um, the arthropod decline and, uh, and the entomological methods, the traditional toolkit. Um, then uh, this review we did, uh, what is the current practice in insect conservation research? Um, a little bit of ethical detour is that why does it matter? Why, why should we, uh, I would argue we should, but why should we de uh, care about insects or about arthropods? Um, and I think with emphasis, I would like to talk about arthropod conservation. Somehow, the, the traditional word usage is insect conservation. But I think that's too narrow and we risk forgetting about you know, non-insect arthropods. So in, in everyday use, uh, these things always simplify, become more and more simple. Um, but I think arthropod conservation is, is uh, <clears throat> a better term. And then a little bit of uh, available toolkit, just very, very uh, quickly. What are the alternatives? So, uh, you know, the first uh, article, this is a, a review by Paul Eggleton in 2020, um, looking at uh, um, arthropod decline. 
and uh, uh, he does he starts the review with a, a quick uh, roundup. You know, the first um, articles he found was 1970, when there were only three, if, yeah, uh, devoted to the topic. Then it very quickly started to increase, and and more and more uh, studies. You know, by 2010. Uh, already that year, more than 160 papers uh, uh, dealt with this phenomenon. There are a few famous ones. Um, this Hallman and, uh, and others, uh, 2017, they compared simply the biomass of um, arthropods collected in insect monitoring schemes in, I think, 27 uh, German protected areas where this routine uh, monitoring uh, <clears throat> uh, has been uh, done for for decades, and they report a 75% decline. Oh, sorry, the years is 27. Okay, so 27 years, 63 protected areas, and uh, um, about 75% decline in biomass, and. Uh, if you look at the peak of arthropod uh, activity in the summer, then the decline is even more. It's more than 80%. Um, then another famous paper by uh, uh, Sanchez, Bayou, and Wickus, uh, who basically summarized the science and, and information available about uh, arthropod decline. They talk about insect decline as well. And uh, there are various aspects in that paper, a very very widely cited paper, very much criticized paper. You know, we, we like to, to criticize each other. But one of the things uh, they mention, for example, the red lists. You know, arthropods are not represented properly in red lists anyway. But whatever is represented, about 40% of those are uh, in, in decline. Um, so basically, there are several reasons for this. Um, um, the PNES in uh, uh, 2021 devoted a special issue or section to the phenomenon, and the summary of that is basically, uh, you know, they, they uh, talk about a death by a thousand cuts. So various anthropogenic impacts starting from, uh, you see, um, forestry, um, uh, large-scale agriculture, industrial agriculture, urbanization, um, none of them are, are uh, fatal, but in concert they really have uh, quite an impact. Um, and everyday experience as well. You know, I've been driving from Denmark uh, by car, and now these days I don't have to wash the windscreen. The whole trip can go, and uh, I remember Many years ago, even in Hungary, you go from Budapest to Balaton and then you have to clean the windscreen. So really the number of insects also in, in everyday impression is, is decreasing. <clears throat> Oops, okay. This one is going very fast. Uh-huh. So, then I abandon the more developed technology. No, it's, it's the same. Okay, so many of the methods, insect methods, are non-selective. You see the Malay strap, uh, which catches um, basically uh, on flying insects, and the common reaction is that an insect hits an obstacle, it will fly upwards. And practically, you know, this is the tent, and here is the catching device. So every uh, flying insect ends up in, uh, in the trap. Um, emergence traps or the yellow sticky trap, anything, you know, the, the sticky material is not selective. Or a pitfall trap, this way, anything which crawls and, and uh, falls into the trap um, is... Uh, remains there. So bycatch is very, very common. Um, and here is one example. That's uh, from Marco, one of Marco's students uh, last year. She collected uh, 
uh, in nearly 300 traps, more than 30,000 arthropods. Um, and the target was carabids and spiders. And you see only 22% uh, of all the arthropods captured were spiders and 19%. So let's say 40% of kind of useful catch, 60% of, of insects killed were not uh, um, used. So that's bycatch is really massive. Um, okay, so there is something wrong with, with this. Now, okay, so if I do that, again, we'll jump three. Okay, that's a particular thing. And also when you, okay, when you look at uh, um, methodological books, like uh, Southwood, insect methods, um, they don't put any particular emphasis on non-lethal methods. There are some mentioned, but, but uh, it's just, you know, a kind of silence in, in that. So, um, the normal toolkit in insect conservation science. Let's see if I do this. Nothing happens if I do this. Maybe. Okay, so there are several uh, conservation biology journals, but there are two, Journal of Insect Conservation and Insect Conservation Diversity, which is devoted to research on uh, protecting these arthropods. And we looked at only the primary papers in one or both journals. Insect Conservation Diversity is the older one. And uh, um, seven years from 2014 to 2020, and we just looked at what methods did they use? Uh, what was the focus of the study? Was it a single species, a group, or multiple species? And was it in a tropical area or non-tropical area? So you see that uh, uh, almost uh, 300 papers during that time. And uh, about 58% uh, of those employed lethal methods and an additional 12% both lethal and non-lethal. So only about 30% in a journal devoted to protecting arthropods or insects uses non-lethal methods. So it's really uh, a bit odd, you know, like you try to protect insects by killing them. Yeah? And uh, a single species focus, uh, there was um, a higher share of non-lethal methods you see, 55%. Uh, um, when multiple species were studied, uh, it was only about 22%. And there is also geographical, which is not surprising. In non-tropical areas, we generally know the arthropods, arthropods a bit better. So if it was a non-tropical region, then uh, about 35% was non-lethal, but only about 12% if it was from a tropical region. Um, and by and large, a similar um, uh, picture was in the other journal. There are more articles, more than 500. And you see that almost half of them used lethal methods and uh, another 7%. So altogether, more than 50% used lethal method or at least one lethal method. And uh, here, about 46% uh, use non-lethal methods. And it's a similar thing, you see single species focus, only 15% uses lethal methods, but when several groups, 62%, tropical, non-tropical is the same thing. So this is, uh, this is a bit odd. We looked at other, um, something, yeah. Um, by different orders. And here, look at uh, the green color, which is a lethal method, and this uh, funny gray, which is not, not the same th color on the screen, uh, which is the non-lethal method. And here we have the non-tropical versus tropical, and uh, different orders. Uh, dragonflies, butterflies, uh, grasshoppers, beetles, uh, wasps, hymenoptera, and flies, diptera. And you see that uh, um, in these three groups, dragonflies, butterflies, and uh, grasshoppers, there is a tradition of using non-lethal methods. So you see that uh, 
the majority of them is this gray color, but then others, partly because they are more species rich, we know them uh, less about them, but then you see the green column dominates even in non-tropical area. Uh, but the tropical one is mostly uh, um, lethal uh, methods. There are a few sort of shades to this, but basically the other thing is that uh, uh, we looked at other papers as well, where the main conclusion is that uh, in, in major conservation biology journals, uh, a minuscule part is devoted to non-vertebrates. So conservation, that's also well known that conservation biology is focused on vertebrates. Um, and, you know, over seven years, I mean, for example, in conservation biology, we found only about 5% of the articles which is not dealing with vertebrates or, or the new trend is human behavior and attitudes towards conservation. That's, that's a very strong increase uh, area. So um, the first part then say most entomological studies, even the ones uh, uh, focusing on protecting um, arthropods, uses lethal methods, um, especially when the focus is more than a single species. Um, tropical regions, that's uh, also more used. Uh, many methods have frequent bycatch and uh, there are some groups or some, uh, you know, Lepidoptera, Orthoptera and so on, where there is a tradition of using non-lethal methods, but that's more or less the exception. It's, it's, it's not the rule. Um, now, why does this matter? Um, we, can, we can argue um, along several lines. One is, which, which comes to people mostly, is uh, the utilitarian, that arthropods are useful. Um, of course, there are many pest arthropods, there are many uh, um, veterinary arthropods, some, some arthropods uh, also spread human diseases, but they are very, very important uh, in ecological functions. Uh, one thing which is very fashionable at the moment is pollination, for example. Um, uh, most or many of our crops, protected, uh, sorry, cultivated crops are um, insect or animal pollinated, which means, especially in a temperate region, arthropod, mostly, uh, you know, insect uh, pollination. It is declining. Um, I think yesterday uh, I, I uh, wrote, uh, yeah, I saw a paper in Journal of Applied Ecology from the Netherlands where they uh, analyzed the biology of uh, endangered plants in the Netherlands. And they demonstrated that in the last, uh, I think, 1960s, uh, the density of insect or arthropod pollinated plants has drastically decreased in, in the Netherlands. So that's more a, a nature conservation concern. <coughs> But of course, uh, there are many other functions, biological control, decomposition, where arthropods are really vital. And this is why Ed Wilson, a very famous evolutionary biologist and ecologist, famously said that it's the little things which run the world, by which he meant that arthropods are essential for proper ecological functioning of virtually any system. But the other is, uh, uh, Utilitarian, but, but not um, a direct benefit to us. And basically, um, if we say that uh, the world's biodiversity constitutes a value in itself, then most of those are arthropods. We, we don't know how many species live on Earth, but we already know that the majority of them, or a large part of them, are arthropods. So really most of the world's biodiversity is arthropods, or are. These two are actually jumping spiders from Australia. Uh, they were discovered not so long ago. So I, I just uh, cut the, the photographs because they are really very beautiful. The other one is um, whether arthropods can be considered so-called ethical subjects. 
um, uh, René Descartes, a French uh, philosopher and mathematician, <coughs> um, this quote is, is from, from him, and he believed that uh, um, animals are simply uh, machines. And that really has quite a, quite a lot of influence even in today's thinking of pe people thinking and, and also the language. You know, I mean, we, we very frequently talk about mechanisms. You know, that goes back to, to you know, um, engineering. So Descartes, uh, for example, um, did um, dissection of uh, dogs without um, anesthesia or anything because he believed that the dog was, was uh, uh, whining and everything, but is a machine, just reacts to this, but doesn't feel pain. Therefore, we shouldn't consider, we, we need not consider about their welfare or damage or anything, because they don't have interests, and therefore they are not so-called ethical subjects. But that was the uh, um, sort of dominant uh, thinking at that time, but there is an example here which I found not so long ago. Um, Sir William Jones was a very famous Orientalist of his time. And uh, the Asiatic Society uh, anniversary talk, uh, uh, which was one of the very prestigious occasions, he writes this, you see, that he could not imagine by what right or with what feelings will a naturalist kill an insect uh, sorry, a, a bird, and leave its young to perish in a cold nest because it has gay plumage, uh, colorful plumage, or even butterflies. Why do we kill a butterfly just because it's rare and beautiful? So there was an undercurrent of concern even in those times. Um, and when you think about these ethical subjects, and they are three criteria. One is that the organism does or does not feel pain. Um, the other is that do they think, because very frequently consciousness or thinking is one criteria that we apply to ourselves and also higher animals. And therefore, do they have any interests? And the first question traditionally was, uh, the answer was no. 1984 was uh, a, a famous article um, reviewing the, the mechanisms, uh, you know, the, the um, nervous system of arthropods, and the conclusion was that they do not have the capacity to feel pain. And that was uh, quite the agreement, and uh, it was uh, not so long ago, last year, and uh, I think the year before, yes, 23 and 22, that some doubts started to emerge. Um, there was a re-examination of uh, nociception means feeling damage or feeling an, an, um, an impulse or an effect which is damaging to the organism. And uh, they looked at the molecular mechanisms um, as well as the anatomy, and the conclusion is you see that insects do have the mechanisms to feel pain. It's just not the same as we do, or vertebrates do. So it's a different mechanism, but definitely they have the kind of physical capability to, because long time ago, feel, uh, p people argued that, for example, if you, if you do something nasty to a beetle, the beetle tried to get away. So on a behavioral level, it was obvious that it, it realized, it reacted to a damaging impulse and was trying to save itself or get away from this. But that was not enough. They say uh, they, they behave as if, you know, they realize, but they don't have the neurological mechanisms. But now it seems that they do. And uh, the other review was uh, in 2013. Now, I have never seen this. I, did you see? I didn't touch anything and it went. That's a, that's a funny thing. Anyway, so um, the answer today is probably yes. Arthropods can feel pain. So criterion number one. The number two 
is uh, do they think? And uh, one is just a detour, this is not an arthropod, that we know, for example, cephalopods uh, have <clears throat> a kind of intelligence now, and even the, there is an EU directive, you know, this one, which actually uh, recognizes that uh, cephalopods have cognitive capacities. So really, it's not limited to higher vertebrates, and sort of this kind of a, a retreating frontier, because historically, uh, we thought that only humans can think, so to say, and argue. Then they realized, oh, well, maybe dolphins, cetaceans can do that, um, cephalopods can do that. So it's more and more groups where we realize that it's not so simple uh, as we believed. But also when you think about uh, um, arthropods, for example, a spider um, repairing a, a, a spider web. You know, it's, it cannot be predicted where the web will be damaged. So really it cannot be kind of pre-programmed that the, that the spider realizes that this is the place where the web was damaged and I have to do this and that. So it really cannot function in a mechanistic way. So there, there is some sort of capability of thinking about this. And also, you know, when well, the, the bees, if they orient, for example, you know, in the hive, they, they realize that uh, from a certain um, <coughs> orientation point, they, for example, have to move 90 degrees, and they are able to, to uh, react uh, also in different positions, right? So if the sun is, for example, here, then they correctly identify this angle, but if the, experimentally the sun is de you know, deflected, then you know, these different situations see that some sort of abstract thinking is necessary for the bee to, to find uh, the source of, for example, in this case, the source of nectar under different environmental references. Okay, so this sort of um, demonstrates that the insect have, I'm not saying that, uh, uh, you know, one day I don't have to give this seminar and a bee will give the seminar, you know, it's, it's degrees, but it's, it's kind of degree rather than a drastic difference. So the, the answer for the second is also yes. Um, and the third one, do they have interests? Now, um, interests are basically, um, you know, the capacity who, uh, to avoid damage and to look for um, conditions and situations which are favorable to the individual. Okay, so an individual has an interest if... Uh, <clears throat> it can respond to the conditions and then kind of evaluate whether it's positive or negative. Okay? So in that sense, it's very likely that they do have interests as well. Um, <clears throat> now, if we accept that therefore the insects should be considered as ethical subjects, then what is the right way to react, and the question is, and then it it uh, becomes similar to normal ethical uh, questions, you know, like uh, humans, how humans relate to each other. And uh, one, which I mentioned at the uh, at the beginning, that um, something which has a value for us, then we try to save it or not damage it because basically then we damage ourselves. Um, so there is this instrumental value. And I already mentioned that arthropods do have this because you know, they essentially in pollination, there are several functions. So um, arthropods as a group have instrumental value for us. Um, they also have ecological value. I mentioned that as well, you know, like irrespective whether we benefit from that or not for many uh, uh, ecological systems. Remember the example from the plants in Holland? So the arthropods are important for they 
survival and, and maintenance. Um, and then you can also um, argue that uh, once they are ethical subjects, they have intrinsic value, irrespective of usefulness to humans or not. You know? And uh, that could be um, you know, value dependent. So we just say, OK, those two um, jumping spiders, the Australian jumping spiders, are very beautiful. I will never see them. They, they're not useful for me, but I somehow feel that the world is more full if they exist. You know, like they have a value because they exist. And uh, it could be me or humans because we think that, uh, that they add something beautiful to the world. But there is also what is called an objective intrinsic value, which means that it doesn't matter. They have a value even if there is no human there who does this valuation. There is a big discussion, philosophical discussion. Uh, you know, uh, Ralph Ralston uh, says that, uh, he argues that uh, there is objective value in the world irrespective of uh, humans realizing that value or not. But that's, uh, that would be a, a, a topic of a much longer and controversial seminar. And also, another approach is um, the capability approach. It's Marta Nussbaum, who is a, a, a very famous, eminent uh, philosopher. And uh, she uh, writes that helping something to flourish, whether it's a human being or an organism, is a positive thing, is a good thing. And doing damage to them or preventing them from realizing their potential is a negative thing. And we should try to behave in a sort of right or good way. Um, so she says that there is waste and tragedy if a living being cannot fulfill those functions for which it exists or for what uh, this uh, uh, can perform. So that's irrespective of any value or, or usefulness. So if we accept that, then OK, what shall we do? What are, what are the methods which are available? And the advantages would be that uh, uh, we interfere less with the world, that uh, there is no destruction and no moral burden to this. And uh, also, more and more, the science is linked, or the, the public questions the investment in science. And uh, then this connection between nature and people is we, we started to realize that if that link is not there, then uh, there will be quite serious psychological consequences and problems for humans. Um, so this um, extinction of experience with nature will not happen. So one there are several possibilities. One is uh, you know, um, damaging an organism but not killing it. Uh, so for example, mutilation. So, uh, you can collect DNA material from, from maybe a small part of an arthropod, which is a negative impact, but it doesn't kill the insect. Maybe you decrease the probability of survival, but it's not a direct killing. Um, another type of method could be that uh, um, um, you modify the behavior or causing, causing stress or discomfort to the, to the organism. And uh, the third one is uh, a truly not only non-lethal method, but also the uh, non-damaging method. So you don't disturb, you just observe the organism. Um, this is what it does. I don't know why, but... Um, OK, so that was the third one. That's, that's how it goes. So um, one method is this, which was uh, you know, very well known. And all 
This is a refuge trap where uh, this was done in, in Israel actually, but we used a similar method in, in Hungary many, many years ago where overwintering insects would, would crawl into this uh, wrapped up uh, um, paper and uh, then you can open it and you can collect or identify the insects and, and Marco was doing exactly that and here is the uh, several hundred arthropods you see here most of them were spiders this was work in, in Israel in the Negev desert but you see that the vast range of different organisms can be uh, uh, collected and uh, there, there you can observe them, identify them, and release. Um, another possibility is uh, <clears throat> uh, using various uh, versions of art uh, artificial intelligence. Uh, computer vision is helping to identify photograph or filmed uh, arthropods. Um, you can employ machine learning to um, identify these organisms. That's very, very quickly developing. You can also monitor insect sounds, um, arthrop uh, especially orthoptera. There's quite a lot of experience with that already. Um, uh, various radar entomology is also has a, has a long um, history. Um, the resolution used to be rather crude, but also is uh, uh, very quickly improving, and uh, various environmental eDNA where uh, you can collect uh, <coughs> uh, fresh, you can collect uh, water, and so on and so on, and uh, very quickly uh, the, the environmental DNA analytical methods are very quickly uh, developing, so you can gain a lot of information about uh, various arthropods uh, without collecting them or even without seeing them. So these, uh, this review was, I think, in uh, Entomologia Experimentalis Applicata in 2022, where it's... Um, artificial intelligence is very uh, fashionable at the moment. There's a lot of discussion about that. Um, and I think there is, there is a fair degree of techno-optimism here. Um, artificial intelligence is useful for many things, but it's not a panacea. It will not solve everything. But of course, when he, many of the champions, including Tokyo Hoye, who is my colleague in Aarhus, actually, uh, he talks about uh, revolutionizing entomology and things like that. I think that's a little bit of an exaggeration um, because it can be uh, very useful, but you need to train the, uh, the artificial intelligence and in some groups uh, simply identifying the species is not there. So there is no teaching material. Okay? So that, that can be an obstacle. Um, so training data sets uh, are uh, not always available. Um, then for eDNA for example, you need a good reference database because otherwise it's useless. Um, and uh, it's not so easy. They talk about this integrating uh, deep learning and molecular tools, but when you start scratching it or ask back, you say, what do you mean precisely? There is a lot of scratching of, of heads because it's not so clear. So it's, it's more a wish at the moment rather than, than reality. So artificial intelligence will be very useful in many situations, but it's not, uh, uh, it's not the final solution. The other thing is uh, that um, instead of uh, uh, sort of damaging um, discomfort or, or observing, you can already use the bycatch, the already dead material, um, which, which is, again, you know, could be very useful. Um, for various reasons. But the thing is that you have to think about it. For example, um, um, automated um, identification or 3D methods of already existing entomological collections that, uh, <clears throat> that could be uh, 
uh, very, very useful for future references. Um, there is also a lot of uh, uh, citizen science initiatives. Uh, you know, that uh, uh, these are just various uh, uh, websites where uh, people, even non-experts, can upload their observations or preferably with documentation. So it's a photograph or, um, you know, mobile phones are pretty uh, smart at the moment. So, um, for example, in iNaturalist, uh, you know, more than 50 million observations are available. Most of them are insects, a little bit, uh, not so much, but 10% of them spiders. And this is a very, very valuable resource. And, uh, and also it's a very good way of trying to engage the public with contact with nature. You remember this extinction of experience is a real uh, risk. So um, more and more people will be able to, you know, even without expertise, to contribute to knowledge. So, and uh, typically these are non-lethal methods, so you don't, you don't damage the organism. And in some cases, uh, you have to think about your research question, because very frequently you are interested in an outcome of a function or a process, not necessarily who did this. Okay, so for biological control, for example, in many situations, you don't want to know precisely which organism is responsible for maybe reducing the density of a pest. You just want to know that if an intervention like uh, planting flowering crops and strips in, a, in a, a field, does it reduce or does it not reduce the pest density, what we want to do? We are less interested in that situation is saying, is it beetles, is it birds, is it parasitoids who did this? So the sentinel method is one approach which we, we used extensively. And in fact, if I remember some years ago, Marco was giving a seminar here on the use of uh, uh, one particular method, which is these artificial caterpillars. So where, where you look at... Uh, um, various non-living entities, like this one is, is a, a, a soft plasticine, which looks like a butterfly, it's a butterfly larva, like a caterpillar, and some of the uh, natural enemies mistake it for a prey, so they try to bite it or, or destroy it, and you can identify that. So you can have some sort of quantification of the, of the effect, and similar thing exists with pollination, where you know it's a, a, a known number of flowers are exposed to pollinators. Um, you see that here the uh, insects or arthropods cannot um, reach, so that's kind of self-pollination versus um, arthropod pollination. You can do the same with seed predation. So in many situations. Uh, you want to know what the arthropods do rather than which is the species responsible for the effect. So that's another approach which does not damage um, the arthropods. And uh, uh, of course, you know, when we argue for, for the uh, larger use of uh, non-lethal methods, we do not say that all the lethal methods can be sort of forgotten and, and no need for them because there is. So that's just a kind of, I'm not saying it's self-protection, but one of the criticism is that what if you cannot identify and many species can only be identified if you have a specimen and all that. We recognize that yes, non-lethal methods cannot replace the whole toolkit of entomology, but what is important is, is to you know, precisely identify what is your research question. What do, you want to, what do you want to know? Are you interested in species richness or are you interested in genetics? And then you can try to choose the appropriate method and preferably a non-lethal one to answer your research question. Um, Sometimes we don't even need a species level identification. There are two papers here where, you know, one 
says that a species diversity can be estimated even by family diversity, so it doesn't need to be necessarily a species level diversity. Um, and you see that uh, sometimes uh, you can try to use a surrogate group to try to estimate the whole diversity. So in some situations you do not need a species level identity. So what, where, where, what, so where does it leave us? You know, the, the conclusion is that one is, yes, species identification sometimes needs a specimen, but you don't always need a species level identification. It depends on your research question. Uh, think more about um, the methods. Is a non-lethal alternative available? And if it is, I think it's a good idea. If you have to collect uh, material, you know, then is there a, a, a special method to, to try to catch that group, which is your target, you know, be that a pheromone or, or a, a certain behavioral feature? Um, can you reduce um, a bycatch, a massive killing? Um, what is the minimum sample size? that you need to answer your research question. And if your method will have bycatch, how to make sure that the bycatch can be used in the future. But more, and this is why it's in red, uh, it's, it's uh, something which we need to ask ourselves as well. Is my research question worthy enough to pursue? Not all the questions have to be answered. Somehow, you know, scientists say that information is gold. Whatever I, I know, it will be useful enough, so I go out and do it. Stop and think that not all the research questions need an answer. So I think this aspect would make us uh, probably also better scientists. So in summary, arthropod decline is happening. Um, we need to convince the population, the non-experts, that arthropods are worth protecting and, uh, and engage them to help us in that because scientists only will not be able to achieve arthropod protection or, or uh, preservation. And uh, then we may argue, and many entomologists argue, that in the course of research, the number of arthropods killed is minuscule. There was a very interesting uh, a, a Dutch entomologist wrote me uh, defending the practice of pitfall trapping, saying that in, in the Netherlands uh, since 1959 there has been a massive pitfall trapping operation for, you know, it's, it's still running. And I say that they collected uh, three million uh, insects or something. But he says, well, actually, when we were driving to the, to the study locations by cars, calculating the number of kilometers and uh, estimating how many ground beetles were squashed on the road, that number is almost 10 times bigger than what we collect and kill. So why does it matter? I think ethically it matters because we cannot convince anyone else saying that arthropods are worth protection, but actually we are exempt. We can do whatever we want, but you have to protect arthropods. It's an impossible thing. No one will believe us. So it's not a numbers game. It's an attitude that we, we have to show an example. Um, and also, uh, you know, as I argued that Arthropods are ethical subjects, they, they uh, feel pain, they try to avoid things, and of course it's a challenge. I mean, entomology's toolkit is mostly lethal methods. I'm not saying that we can just use a non-lethal method, but I think we can develop uh, a lot of these things. And also it would be a good idea if journals, even, even the two arthropod conservation journals, do not require any justification in the methods. 
why did a study use a lethal method? So that's really odd. So journals can ask actually not to forbid using lethal methods, but at least there are, the, the scientists should be mindful of this and they kind of have to argue why this method was the appropriate one. And also research funding. Uh, funders might, uh, I think it would be a good idea if people should, uh, how to say, justify the use of lethal methods. Because in some cases, yes, that's the appropriate one, but thinking about it, not always, but I think it would be uh, um, also a good uh, development. So with that, uh, thank you for your attention. Here, um, part of the presentation is still a number of articles in this, which uh, people can consult if they want. But uh, that was the last one. So thank you very much for your attention. And if you have any questions, discussions, or anything, more than welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. I must say that I totally agree. So we should stay what, folks. But no questions. Yeah. Thank you very much. Very interesting. So I wanted to ask uh, how uh, is the recognition that uh, arts approach uh, feel pain might affect legislations or ethical permits? So currently, in most institutions around the world, if you do some research on vertebrates, you have to do, you have to apply for a special committee to, to have permits, but this doesn't involve um, insects or arthropods in general. On the basis, usually the argument is that they don't feel pain, which yeah. I always yeah. found completely absurd because behaviorally, as you said, you can see yeah. that they yeah. they can feel discomfort, and and uh, so it's uh, now it's, uh, it seems to be that it's even scientifically proven. So do you think that it would or it should um, affect these kind of legislations and not just like ethical permits for research but also like general legislation? So for example in Hungary and in most European countries we have very strict rules about uh, animal torture, torture, but it doesn't, again, doesn't affect uh, insects. Yeah. So I can torture yeah. as many uh, vehicles uh, as I want and without any consequence. So do you think yeah. that it should also involve this Yes, I, th I think it should, and that's a personal opinion, um, uh, and I think it will happen. Maybe not as strict as for vertebrates, uh, but probably this is, this is coming. Yeah. But as I, as I showed you, uh, the, the current consensus, uh, I mean, this realization that the insects or arthropods have the new neurological mechanisms to feel pain is relatively recent. So I think it will take about, I would say, 10 years or so until this goes uh, wider recognized and it will go into uh, any sort of legislation. I think the first one will be that, that uh, the, the ethical uh, permits or, or ethical aspects will be taken more seriously. But uh, eventually I think it, it, will, uh, it will be. Yes, thank you. This was really interesting. I completely agree with all these points. Uh, but I'd like to see some kind of, uh, I don't know if you have the data, some kind of quantification of uh, this insect or arthropod mortality attributed to research, even driving to the other side, including that. So compared to, let's say, logging off a hack out of forest or something like that, mm -hmm. like how does that compare? Is there any data available or uh, any kind of quantification? Um, I think uh, a comparative quanti quantification, uh, I, I don't know any. So how does it compare, for example, clearing a hectare of a forest? Um, I don't think that anyone actually estimated the, the number or the biomass of insects or arthropods in a hectare of forest and then compare that. Very, very likely, uh, you know, it is. It is probably less. Uh, but then, uh, how do you compare what with what? So a hectare of forest, maybe that's one. 
what is the other? You know, is it one year's work or a university's work or um, uh, all the f all the projects uh, funded by Otka? Sort of. Yeah, I don't think anyone uh, anyone calculated this yet. Or even uh, the number of pitfall studies, I guess. Yeah. Whatever it's published, that yeah. can be. Yeah. But it's a very good idea because now um, next month there will be a European Cannabidiologist Conference in uh, in Budapest, here, and I was asked to talk about this subject, so I think I'll take some <laughs> some of the cannabis studies as examples. Yeah, but I think the strongest argument is that uh, really is uh, as I as I mentioned, you know, it's not a numbers game. It's probably more important. Uh, uh, the other aspects are, especially the relationship between entomologists and the public. Yeah, and I think that's the, probably that's the strongest argument why, even if these numbers uh, are, are grossly unequal, even if we don't do a lot of damage uh, by doing research in absolute numbers, and it doesn't threaten populations there, Andras, you probably know that there, there were some examples where very rare insects were actually exterminated from a site by extensive collections. It did happen, not frequently, but there are a few cases. Um, so it can cause a, a, a serious damage, but I think the strongest thing is that we are in, in, in no position to argue uh, for, for conservation, for whatever reason, we, because we can even, even say that some of us say that for me, the, the most important thing for arthropods is utility. Others say that they are beautiful, and so on and so on. Uh, but I think the strongest is that arguing uh, uh, with the public uh, this way or that way, and I think it's very, very important. Yeah. I'll comment on the question. The comment is that there was a uh, the dear come about the methods used in the different uh, insect groups. Yes, and uh, for example, uh, dragonflies, uh, we can identify them usually by photo, but yeah. in the case of human plants, uh, we should catch and kill them. Yeah. Certainly. And, and uh, my question is maybe a bit joking, but it's a, not a joke. Uh, when we, how do you uh, think when we keep the insects uh, in the lab. Do they feel themselves in, in, in the prison? So, uh, because I don't like to kill insects. Uh, yeah. And it is the reason that I like to work with alive insects. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, there is an American um, organization called Insect Welfare Society. I never knew about them, but they spotted our paper. So they invited us to give a seminar about this, so we, we gave that about a month ago through video. And they are concerned, and they, there are sort of emerging things like um, insects which are produced for food, you know, like edible insects or for protein, that the conditions how they are kept should be sort of considered, just, just like with, with uh, domestic animals, you know, chicken or, or pigs or others. Um, and uh, yeah, providing them with uh, hope as much as possible natural impulses and environment. So that we should, uh, they argue that we should consider uh, sort of keeping that or the conditions, modify the conditions so that we cause as little stress as possible. Another question. So you mentioned that um, you had a personal impression that as you drive through Hungary, there are less, yeah, uh, yeah. fewer insects that hit your windshield than like decades ago. So I'm not questioning, of course, the, the reality of decline of um, insects. But I'm, maybe it's a silly question, but I'm, I'm just uh, wondering whether there can be any selection on, on insects. Uh, over like several decades of high traffic, uh, so that they avoid the roads. Maybe they just fly higher or something. Do you think that is possible? 
I would say it's not impossible. I've never, never thought about this myself, but I haven't done research on this, and I'm not aware that anyone did. But it's a good, good question. It's possibly worth, uh, yeah, worth answering or studying. But some, but some behavioral reactions, you know, like I know that, for example, when a, a brown bear will frequent if they're walking and it hits a path, then it will frequently turn away. Uh, but that's, I'm not saying that this, it, it does because realizing that crossing the road is dangerous. Um, but I'm not sure. It has any it words. So but there's, a, there's a study in words showing that uh, in Swedos, uh, the wind shape has changed in the past decades due to, probably due to section, uh, uh, with, to, uh, due to collisions with cars. Mm -hmm. So words, this kind of uh, evolution is happening. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean it's not, it's not unexpected. Uh, so the, the, the wind is becoming rounder. Yes, it's exactly. Easier, exactly. easier to, to exactly. monitor. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh -huh. yeah. So it's not impossible. Yeah. Okay. Last question? If you have one. Thank you again, Carlos.